All right, let's get to the details now. It's been five years, but today justice has been served. Abuga Pele was in court. Starting today, uh, former national coordinator of Jida, Abuga Pele, will begin serving six years in prison after being found guilty of causing financial loss to the state in the $2 million scandal. Businessman Philip Asibi, charged with defrauding uh, by false pretense, has also been convicted. He'll serve 12 years in jail. We'll hear shortly from Manasseh Azure Awine, who first broke the news in 2013. But first, here's Joy News' legal affairs correspondent, Joseph Akable. He was in court. We'll bring you Akable's report shortly, but uh, he is back here and now, and we'll be having a conversation right after this. A quick look at the background of this case. Now, they was heard in, a, in, the, in an Accra High Court, the financial division of the Accra High Court. The judge who sat on this matter, Justice Ifia Sewa Saribotri, and the trial commenced as far back as January 24th, 2014. What are the charges being leveled against Mr. or that were leveled against Mr. Bugapelli? Well, five count of willfully causing financial loss to the states. That's one. Two, two counts of abetment of crime to the state. And three, one count of intentionally misappropriating public property. Ms. Abugapele, of course, as you were well know, was coordinator of the national of the national Ghana Youth Employment and Entrepreneurial Agency, GIDA. The next person with whom he was convicted today is Philip Asibet. He's a businessman. What are his charges? Five counts of dishonestly causing loss to public property, two counts of abetment of crime, and six counts of defrauding by false pretense. He was the CEO of Goodwill International Group. Abu Gapele and Asibit signed a memorandum of understanding which gave the GIG, which is a company Mr. Mr. Uh, Philip Asibit Hertz, the mandate to render services without recourse to the Minister of Employment at the time. Mr. Asibit is said to have given false representation that he has secured a 65 million loan facility from the World Bank for the implementation of the Youth Enterprise Development Program, YEDP. This is what the prosecution says. It's been a breaking news throughout the day and something that's kept all news persons moving around. We'll, be bring, we'll hear from uh, Joseph Akable, who was in court, to recount everything that happened in court for us today. We'll also bring you his report from there. You get to see how they all look, perhaps. But let's go to Parliament. We've been sampling some views from some of the parliamentarians. We can hear from Rashid Popo. Oh, I think so. I think the, 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 the years have shocked us. But that's the judge. I don't know what considerations he had. You know, he put in play. He 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 um, took into consideration what he took into consideration before that judgment. But I would have wished that there would have been some amount of consideration for what he has done, the service he rendered to Ghanaians for all these years as a member of parliament, three-time member of parliament and then slipping along the line so he could be jailed but not this much mm. shouldn't that rather be the case to serve as a deterrent to others when they get the opportunity to manage the public pay indeed it's, it's it's a very it's a very um serious deterrent it's a big deterrent in fact the people i have met all the people i have met who spoke to me 
have been so sad this morning. From both sides of parliament, all of them are calling it a sad day and, and they are shocked. So that element of deterrence has played out well. Rashid Popo there, obviously, he doesn't necessarily agree with that judgment there. It's not for him to call, by the way. Joseph Akabli has been in court. He's here with me in the studio. Joseph, it's good to see you. So it's it's been a very you. interesting day for those of you who report from, from court, hasn't it? Uh, it's one of the days you need to be extra careful, else you can land in trouble. I know, I know. Because a lot of people are also reporting, um, misquoting the, the figures in terms of the numbers that have been uh, handed down. The jail term has been handed down to these people. Let's get a bit of clarity on that before we move on to talk about how they looked, for example, how they, or what, was, what their demeanor was. So, so it's 6 and 12. So 6 for uh, Mr. Bugapele, the former JIDA national coordinator mm. and 12 years for Philip Asibit. So for the other figures you may have heard, uh, it's because they sentence them according to counts. So okay. you can have six years for some of the counts and four additional years. Uh, but when the court says it runs concurrently, mm -hmm. uh, you don't put the figures together. You together. rather pick the high figure because that's how long he'll be serving. So in terms of uh, doing the, that addition, uh, Mr. Bugapele will be in the custody that is at in Saom for a period of six years whilst the businessman will be in for 12 years. So that is it with regards to the sentencing. Okay, let's look at their demeanor in court. Um, of course, you're not allowed to film inside the courtroom. So explain to us, give us a mental picture of how it looked today. Uh, the two individuals, I must say that uh, Mr. Philip Asibet, who is the CEO of Goodwill International Group, who was said to have rendered some services, for which reason uh, he demanded payment from the state. I can say that he appeared to be in higher spirits compared to Mr. Bugapele when they entered the courtroom. Uh, Mr. Bugapele came earlier, uh, he sat quiet all throughout, uh, just at the second row. Uh, when people who were coming in to come and show support, they shook hands with him, they sat beside him, others sat behind him. Uh, when Mr. Sibit came in, he sat beside him throughout before the court process started. Mm -hmm. I never saw uh, Mr. Pele smile at any point. But for Mr. Sibit, even before he went into the box, I uh, just when he was sitting at the back before the case was called, he kept smiling. He did, when he was exchanging pleasantries with people, he was smiling. In fact, when the judge was reading uh, her decision, uh, he didn't, he looked at her once a while. That's the businessman, Philip Asibet. He looked at the judge once a while, turns away once a while, and looks at uh, the others in the court where the lawyers and ourselves were seated. Mm. Then he kept smiling, especially in instances where the judge had made pronouncements that didn't go in his favor. He smiled at those points and looked at us. But for Mr. Apele, all throughout, his eyes were fixed firmly on the judge. He never moved his mm. head away until mm. the judge finished the entire decision. be interesting to get into his head and find out exactly what's happening there. But Joseph, we're going to play your report. What should we know even before we get to see this report? Uh, so it gives a sense of um, what went into the thinking of the judge. And uh, the judge explains why she arrived at that conclusion, because the issues that were up for determination was whether uh, Mr. Uh, Asibit had contracted, had secured a grant of $65 million as he had claimed. So he wrote a letter to the NYEP after he had signed an MOU with them. He was required to secure a grant of $65 million from the World Bank, apart from the fact that he was also required to recruit 250 youth for training. Then again, he was also to develop an exit program for this youth. So that was the work he said he had done, for which reason he demanded payment of the 3.3 uh, million cities. Now what the court uh, said was that, I mean, they didn't find any evidence to support that claim that he had done any work. In fact, they said, as it stands today, that amount of $65 million has not been approved by the World Bank as we speak now. Mm -hmm. World Bank officials appeared before the court, a World Bank representative at the Ministry of Finance appeared before the court and said that uh, no such approval had been given. Discussions were still ongoing. Mm -hmm. So at the time of writing and stating explicitly that he had secured that amount of money, it had not been secured. And that uh, definitely amounts to a, a lie, yes. lying, to, lying to the state. But were there any questions about whether or not the minister, uh, the JIDA secretary did any due diligence to find out? So the, the, mis the, the issue is that the money involved was of a, a high amount. So mm. the approval could not have just come from Mr. Bugapele as the national coordinator. So for which reason they, they also dragged him to court for causing financial loss to the state because it was expected that he as the head of that institution would do some due diligence. But he wrote a letter because of the figures involved. He wrote a letter to the supervising ministry, which at that time was the Ministry of Youth and Sports. 
uh, headed by Clement Kofi Umado, initially mm -hmm. by a queer senator dancer. We are told that it was under a queer senator dancer that he signed the MOU. He didn't inform the ministry, we are told. Uh, then when he signed that MOU, he again went a step further to write to Clement Kofi Umado, who had just taken over, asking him to give approval for that amount to be paid. Mm -hmm. And that approval was given. The question that people are asking was, why wasn't Mr. Umado perhaps charged uh, because he was a minister that gave the approval and asked that the monies be paid. But the interesting thing that happened is that Mr. Clement Kofi Umado appeared as a prosecution witness. He testified on behalf of the state in court. He told the state that he was fresh at post. He had just taken over as the minister for youth and sports mm. and relied on the expertise of Mr. Bugapele, who was at the Home of Affairs at Ajida, who was recommending payment. And mm. he thought because he was fresh in office, he relied on that and thought it was enough and urged that the payment should be made. Hmm. I, I, it's interesting to find out what the arguments were for for someone like um, Philip Pasivit. What were the argument that his uh, his lawyer advanced? Yeah, his lawyers had insisted that he had an agreement with uh, the NYEP and, for that matter, the state. They had also uh, insisted that he was entitled to the payment because of the work he had done, and uh, he should have been paid that amount of money. They say that. Uh, they had some documents which had been taken over by the Economic and Organized Crime Office uh, when they arrested him initially, mm. commencing investigation. Uh, they had wanted access to those documents. They said that what the, the prosecutors had submitted was a photocopy of those documents, and they wanted the original, and that original one was a bit different from the photocopy one. Uh, but the court was of the opinion that, I mean, it is clear from the evidence available that that photocopy is a photocopy of the original document that he, Mr. Sibit, handed to the Economic and Organized Crime Office. Mm. Uh, but for Mr. Bugapele, his argument was that authorities beyond him, because he said he didn't have the power to give approval for such an amount of money to be paid. Mm. So authorities beyond him did names give approval. Names for the authorities beyond him? The names that came up had to do with the former Deputy Attorney General, Dr. Dominic Ayene. Okay, hold on for me. We'll come back to the names of uh, those who, who were mentioned by Mr. I, um, I almost said Mr. Kubli. <laughs> those who were mentioned by Mr. Bugapele there and Manasseh Azuria when who also joined me in the studio. But here is Joseph's report from the court. The High Court's decision ends the continuous appearance of Philip Asibit, CEO of Goodwill International Group and former JIDA coordinator Abuga Pele at the law court complex. The state prosecutors had alleged an MOU had been signed between the two individuals requiring Mr. Asibit to secure a grant of $65 million funding from the World Bank, recruit 250 people for training, as well as organizing tracer studies. Mr. Asibit is accused of writing a letter to Mr. Pele demanding payment for the work done. The state was convinced, according to prosecution, by the JIDA boss to make payments to the tune of 3.3 million cities to the state. State prosecutor Evelyn Kilson insisted no work had been done by the businessman. Lawyers for the two had justified the payments, while those of Mr. Asibit insisted he had done the work and deserved payment. Mr. Paley's lawyers were of the view that approval from higher authorities in government was given before payments made. Delivering her ruling, Justice Efia Sewa Sariboche said evidence before the court doesn't show that any work was done by Mr. Asibit to merit the payment. The court also held that at the time he was requesting payment, he had not secured any grant from the World Bank and that grant was still yet to be paid. He had also not recruited any 250 individuals as he had claimed or organized any trade studies as he had told the court. The court thus found the former JIDA coordinator guilty of 13 counts ranging from abatement to commit crime to willfully causing financial loss to the state. The businessman Philip Asibit was found guilty of six counts of defrauding by false pretense. She handed the lawyers five minutes to tell the court how much of the money Philip Asibit could refund. Uh, after five minutes of conferring their lawyers, they came and deferred the matter to the state, allowing that the judge for that matter decides and that is for the court to decide. Uh, the ju trial judge again was of the opinion that that amounted to they not demonstrating enough remorse of willingness to return to the state monies that the court has now held were illegally obtained. For that reason she, she proceeded to give the sentence of 12 years for Mr. Philip Asibet and six years for Mr. Abu Gapele. Uh, she again indicated that the state is to proceed to retrieve 
the money that is the 1.9 million dollars the city's equivalent of 3.3 million cities from the individuals through any assets belonging to them once it is possible so we look forward to that appeal that the lawyers have served notice of filing quick pencil confirm that to join news and other pressmen right after proceedings end it and come back for something else Uh, there's a strong possibility that we're going to appeal against the sentence. But did, did the you, conviction uh, and the sentence. The conviction. Is it the case that you still maintain that your client yeah. did no wrong in the entire agreement? I think the judgment, based on what I heard the jury, there are <laughs> fundamental issues. Issues such as what? <laughs> there, there are several issues. Several issues. You're asking me to give you at least one example. That will be fine. Good. Uh, at least on the side of the defense, I'm talking about the A1. The law enjoins the state in prosecuting a matter to make available all evidence in their possession to an accused person. It's a rule of law. There are no flexibilities with it. This is a clear case where there was a lot of evidence they took from the accused person and they refused to deliver those bits and pieces of documentary evidence to the accused person. It's one of the several issues that we address the court upon. This got nothing to do with a substantive matter. The law is both substantive and procedural. And in terms of procedure, if there are certain lapses, there are certain breaches with clear rules of procedure, it always inures to the benefit of the accused person. I heard the judge address the issue by dismissing it and suggesting that the accused person could have applied to the court for those documents that are released to him. But it's not the business of an accused person to apply to the court for that, for, for those things to be released to him. It's as simple as that. The real issue is whether indeed there was such evidence and whether such evidence, if it had come in, could have assisted the accused person. This was our point. So it is irrelevant with due respect to the court. It's irrelevant in our view whether indeed we could have applied or couldn't have applied. The, the substantive issue was not addressed. In our if, if I'm to understand what you are saying, is it, is it your contention that if that document had been made available to you, it could have boosted that defense yeah, that he put call up. It escopatory evidence. Escopatory is favorable evidence. Anything. Because see, the thing about law, the thing about criminal prosecution is that an accused person need not even say anything at all. An accused person can stand mute of the court. And it's the duty of the prosecutor to prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. Yeah. So that is lawyer for uh, Mr. Asibit there. Akable is still here in the studio with me. He speaks of an availability of evidence. Let me also quickly announce that Manasseh Azuri uh, 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 Winnie has joined us in the studio. Manasseh, you're welcome. Manasseh, yeah. you did that story um, in 20, 2013? 13, yes, 2013. Yes. Hold on for me. Let me finish with Joseph Akable. Joseph, speaking of the availability of evidence, do we know the kind of, he says favorable evidence. Do we know the kind of favorable evidence he's talking about here? Uh, it had to do with the original documents that I had explained earlier that he had wanted to have access to because they said they give the original to the Economic and Organized Crime Office. Okay. Uh, but the court had said that the copy of which uh, the state prosecutors had submitted to the court. So if they wanted the original, they could put in an application okay. and have access to it. So he is of the opinion that he thinks that if that had been handed, it may mm. have changed their case because it was it's evidence that is favorable to mm. their case. Uh, but the judge disagreed with them. Before we went, uh, we played that story. We we're talking about uh, Abu Gapele and the names he says. He says some. Authority, authorities higher than him uh, approved the payment of that amount. He so mentioned he, some names. He, he, he had submitted to the court letters he had written uh, to justify the payments. Mm. And in all those letters, he kept mentioning names such as uh, former Deputy Attorney General Dr. Dominic Ayene, names mm. such as former uh, President. At that point, he was Vice President mm. uh, John Dramani Mahama and um, also uh, the Minister himself, uh, Clement Kofi Umado. So the point he had sought to make was that uh, it even had cabinet approval, all those approvals were given before mm. uh, that payment was made. But the judge was of the view that she thinks references were made to those names to create the impression that it had the backing of powers beyond him in order to convince for that payment to be made. And that, that is the same thing he's repeating again in court to shift blame from himself. Who had convinced them? And the judge said that earlier letters he had written was clear. He was clear in his mind that he knew the man had done the work. 
Okay. So yet, if you are trying to convince people it later really on, those matter. things doesn't really matter. Okay, but they're going to appeal. His lawyer says, says uh, later by next week Friday. Do that Later by next week Friday, we'll be here to bring you all of those updates. Joseph Akabli will be following that. Joseph, thank you very much for that update. Let me now engage Manasse Azure Owenu. Manasse, first, let's start with um, your initial thoughts about the case so far. Well, I have followed the case. I know what went to court and. At the end of the day, I can't uh, fault the court for doing its work. And all the time when we are doing stories such as this, what we say is that uh, we want the state to take action beyond what we have done. Mm. And the state took that action. So it's commendable that at least it has gone through the legal process and ended. Right. I, and I, I said that because you've already given us a bit of background. But there are other companies. I mean, this... Uh, case has traveled really far through uh, uh, the, the entire system of this country. There are still some other issues, some other um, companies, that things that were not necessarily a part of this court case. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Yes, what I can say is that if you look at the JIDA uh, scandal, this 3.3 million cities is about the smallest of the scandals we uncovered. And if you read the JIDA report, there mm -hmm. are quite a number of infractions. For instance, if you take that JIDA report, this company, we are told they took money. It took money for work it did not do. Mm -hmm. But if you look at that same JIDA report, we are told another company took money to train youth for training services that were not rendered and they were not needed in the first place. Mm -hmm. This amount is 58.15 million Ghana cities. Okay. And this company is Better Ghana Management Services Limited, owned by the Jospon Group. What I'm saying is in the JIDA report. Okay. That same company uh, paid was paid about 9 million CDs for bicycles it did not render. Mm. If you go to RLG, that company was paid 25.5 million Ghana CDs to train 15,000 youth in ICT. Mm. The company claimed they, were, they could not even verify. The company claimed it trained only 4,222, less than a third, one third of what it was paid for. As we speak, they have not been held accountable. Nobody even followed up to retrieve that money. Mm -hmm. If you look at Zoom Lion, for instance, if you look at page 131 of the JIDA report, quite a number of overcharges were there. So, but we know that some of, I mean, some other persons have shown interest in this case. Some of them have gone to Shwa to petition Shwa, etc. You have the report, uh, the JIDA report, and I'm sure that you followed through. Has anything happened with Shwa since, with Shwa since uh, the report came out? No, for this report, as I said earlier, on quite a number of big companies and individuals are involved, and they were virtually left off the hook. So, um, I know Sydney Kesley Hayford actually petitioned Shraj with the JIDA report mm. and ordered Shraj or petitioned Shraj to look into it and recommend uh, punishment or whatever. Right. So as we speak, that has not been done yet. Shraj has not finished this uh, review mm -hmm. and it was submitted in 2013. Okay. So nothing has happened yet. I am hearing that Shiraj is preparing to submit that report to the Attorney General okay. for action. But as we speak, nothing has been done. And if he mentioned earlier, if you go through the report and even what we uncovered, mm. one thing is clear. One individual whose tenure supervised a lot of the rot in Jida is Clement Kofi Humado, then Youth and Sports Minister, who has also not been touched. Mm. Well, hopefully as the story develops further, and now that there's a special prosecutor, there will be some shake-ups here and there. Manasse, thank you very much. But this does give you a lot of journalistic fulfillment, I, I believe. Well, I don't know how to say about that. <laughs> Manasse Azuri Awene broke that story on Jida, and it's been five years down the lane today. They've been handed 18 year 18-year 18 deal term, both of them, Mr. Philippa Sibit and Mr. Abuja Pele.